Kaku, I do want to introduce uh, Coach Tommy Dennison, who is the current OC for York University. He has a proven track record of success, both with the University of Toronto and St. Mary's University. Coach Dennison coaching background also includes serving as the head coach of the GTA All-Stars in 2016, and that squad's offensive coordinator for four years prior, as well as stints with multiple club teams in Ontario and British Columbia. As a player, Coach Dennison put together an incredible three-year run as the quarterback of the Queen's Gales that returned the program to prominence. He won back-to-back Heck Crichton trophies as National Player of the Year, just the second repeat winner in the history of the award. And in 2002, was the first Canadian University quarterback to pass for more than 3,000 yards in a single season. His best two uh, passing season with the Gales both remain among the U Sports top 10. Coach, thank you so much. I, man, I saw you guys announce some, some cool news at a York the other day, too, about quarterback development. Before you get going, I want I, I want you to tell me how many yards you threw for that one year with the GTL. I, wasn't, wasn't it an insane, like, 700 or something like that? In a game? Yeah. yeah 800 and change. Eight, yeah. 800 and change. Okay, so that's – yeah, I wanted to make sure I, I knew that. So, uh, Coach, thank you for being with us, and, and the floor is yours. Awesome. Yeah, no, thanks, Aaron. This is, this is really, really uh, an awesome event and, and having the chance to listen to, to Irv and, and Tom and Todd and, and Adam uh, over the course of the day today already, being able to take away uh, something from each of them uh, has been fantastic and, and you know, going to continue to listen um, the rest of the evening and then into tomorrow with, with some of our, our colleagues on the defensive side of the ball and, um, you know, obviously a chance to, to appreciate what they do. Um, super excited to talk, and as you said, uh, a little bit about um, um, what we're what we're going to be launching at uh, at York University. I'll be able to talk a little bit about that today as well. Uh, what's really cool uh, um, is that uh, we'll be doing that right here through the pandemic, still through a virtual world. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, for those that uh, want to reach out uh, by email, is great, or by either of my social media accounts. It's Tommy Dennison for either on Instagram or Twitter. I'm, I'm always up for engaging and talking football. Uh, love to do it, love to engage, uh, talk to people on both sides of the border and Europe. Uh, it's really, really fun to, to get different ideas and different uh, uh, realities of what people are facing, no, not just about football in general, but specifically through COVID and, and what, uh, what everybody's different realities are. So by all means, if there's anything that, that you have a question about today or a drill or anything um, concept or scheme wise, Happy to uh, happy to connect and happy to talk. Uh, today, obviously, we're going to be talking about quarterback play and is you know very warm introduction, Aaron. I appreciate it. Uh, basically, the top section says that I, I had the chance to be in a lot of different places as a player and had the chance to experience some uh, some really cool things as a player, both at Queen's University first and foremost, uh, but then obviously Winnipeg, Calgary, and Toronto, and then Albany in the Arena Football League. Uh, highlight for me was getting a chance to, to dress for the very first time as a Canadian quarterback uh, right here in Toronto um, in front of my family. Uh, so the one chance that I got to dress and, and for it to be here and uh, for Matt Dunnigan's uh, Calgary Stampeders. So so really cool. And I had some people who, who provided some tremendous opportunities for me at that time, uh, Matt Dunnigan specifically, uh, you know, to be on that team and to learn and to learn CFL concepts. And what's really cool and really interesting, I think, is how different our game has evolved to uh, today. You know, even, even though, you know, 2005 doesn't seem like that long ago, uh, really only 14 years of playing time because we haven't played in 2020 uh, or yet in 2021. Uh, but the game is just so much different, even from the professional level then to what's being done at the, high, at the university level right now and obviously at the pro level as well. Uh, as a coach, some of the things I'm really, really proud about, uh, both in 2017 and 2019, having the opportunity to run offenses, both at St. Mary's University and, and the University of Toronto, just speaking directly today to two of the great quarterbacks that I had the opportunity to work with. First, Caleb Scott, uh, who was a 2017 uh, AUS first team all-conference quarterback, threw for over 2,000 yards in just six games. Unfortunately, I had a couple injuries that, that uh, held him out, but helped turn a football program from two and six to six and two. And then obviously in 2019 at the University of Toronto, where Clay Sequeira um, did a, a spectacular job and was super fortunate to work with an emerging quarterback like Clay, uh, where he led the nation in passing, uh, touchdown passes, yards, and and uh, broke the yard the touchdown record at the University of Toronto. So, ha been fortunate to have some real success with our quarterbacks, uh, probably in some places that people didn't necessarily expect that that success to come. And we love working uh, with young quarterbacks. And so, uh, as Aaron mentioned uh, right at the very beginning, there was an announcement yesterday that at York we're going to be 
uh, launching on June the 27th, a, a quarterback uh, prospects camp, uh, keep quarterback peak uh, performance camp. Uh, we're we're going to be focusing on theory, technical skills, and leadership. It's going to be an online platform where you can log in. There's going to be over 50 uh, videos that the quarterbacks can get on and, and watch as they're out on the field, and then they'll be able to upload their videos as well. But we're also going to focus on, on scheme, and I think that's something that's a, a lot different than what's available in the marketplace right now. Right now, what you see, and, and we're going to talk about it a lot during this presentation, but quarterbacks are working a lot right now on off-timing throws. And I'm not sure that we're necessarily good enough on on-time throws to be focusing as much as we are right now on off-time throws. And I get it. It sells. It looks great on Instagram. But we really, you know, at the young and developing levels, we really need to focus on, you know, the fundamentals and making sure that we're throwing on time, understanding concepts, understanding reads. So that's what this camp offering is going to put together. And we're really, really excited to offer it. And uh, obviously, if you follow us on any social media platforms for York University or myself at Tommy Dennison 4, uh, there's lots of information about how to find and register for that camp. So I just wanted to really quickly speak to that. But today we're going to be talking about quarterback play. And for us, we think that there are are three major pillars to quarterback play. There's the physical elements, the ability to read or the mental side of the game that people will talk about and the leadership component. And we think that they're all equally important. Uh, today, we're only gonna have opportunity to speak to two. Uh, we're gonna leave the leadership component out. It is, it's a, it's a very, very, very big uh, um, topic. And I think one that deserves its own uh, time. Uh, and for today, for us to be able to marry the physical uh, ability side, as well as the ability to read and kind of put those two things together so that young and emerging coaches who are looking for new ideas, new concepts can see how we're doing it and maybe take something from it and uh, and uh, be able to apply it to what you're doing. So when we look at the physical side, we, we really kind of broken it down to four things. Um, and the first one is probably something, you know, certainly as a player. I didn't focus enough on, and I think there's a lot of players who probably, a lot of us old coaches who played quarterback, um, you know, certainly fall into this, this category, and that's that we didn't do enough in terms of preventative work uh, on our shoulders, on our elbows, on our arms, and it's really, really important, and, uh, you know, working with, I think, uh, one of the best uh, strength and conditioning coaches in the country, uh, and Sam Miles Frain, you know, uh, working and embracing exactly what she brings to the table and making sure that we've incorporated band work, uh, tennis ball work, and, um, you know, a multitude of different things before they even pick the football up every single practice. Uh, in addition to a preventative ice after practice, it's so important uh, to maintaining their arms. So we're, we're going to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, we're going to talk about drills that fit what we want to do, um, and specifically inside of our scheme and concepts. So we're going to talk about, uh, we're a quick, we're a, a, a three-step team, I guess is how most people would describe it, but we're a quick passing team. So you're going to see a lot of actually one step. And we've actually gone away from gun and three to gun and one and reset. And you're going to see a lot of that. Uh, it's not to say that there aren't a few plays still that we look at gun and three, but we're really trying to tailor everything down to getting the ball out as quickly as possible. Um, you know, with some of those stats that you saw from some of the two quarterbacks that we've had the opportunity to work with in recent years, uh, we've thrown the ball a lot, uh, probably as much as anybody in the country, and maybe even more in some cases. And, you know, because we've been a controlled passing team, uh, it's given us the ability to do that and attack perimeters when our offensive lines haven't been maybe uh, as necessarily good as we've wanted them to be or as developed as we've wanted them to be at that point of time. So uh, getting the ball out quickly and efficiently is really important. So we're really looking at ways that we can be even more efficient. And we'll talk about how we've gone from three to one and what you know different things you can do to work on there. Uh, attention to detail and coaching what you see. And you're going to hear us talk about that a lot. We're not going to coach ghosts. We're not going to coach things that we're not sure of. And we're really going to be OK with not knowing exactly what we saw on the field because we only have one set of eyes as coaches. So it's OK to make the point later, You know, capturing everything on film and working through it as we go. And then managing workload, especially from the quarterback perspective. And I think it's going to be a little shocking at times of how many throws that we say we make competitively uh, and how many we're actually making right now. And it's not as many as you think. Then we're going to talk about the side of ability to read. Um, and we're going to talk about how important it is to create rules that are consistent. Um, and, you know, what that means for us is creating a two on one bind. And we'll talk about that. Uh, we're going to focus on improved timing. So how can we get that ball out quicker? And it's not just physically, like how do we speed our feet up? That's going to be one of them. But also how can we get mentally more in tune so that we're ball is coming out on time? Uh, we are going to talk about how even though we're, we're, we're looking at abilities to read, how football uh, footwork allows for, for quicker decisions in everything that we do. And we're going to focus on how we watch film and other uh, aids and uses of um, uh, media 
that allow us to become better in, in what we're doing in terms of uh, our abilities to read. So the first thing is we'll go back to the physical side and we're going to talk about warm up and arm bands and, and working, taking your time through the workout process, through the warm up process. So the first drill that we're going to show you uh, as we warm up, we've gotten a resistance band and we're working on just stretching the arm out and we'll do this for 30 seconds. So we have, an, uh, we have about eight exercises that we do. We're going to show two of them very quickly today, but it's very simple. And it's just, again, stretching it out, making sure that the shoulders are working through the uh, the tightness that they may have experienced. You may be in training camp uh, and you can go from 30 to 45 seconds on drills like this, making sure that, you know, we're really um, taking our time to loosen that arm up and not making, you know, not, not putting any additional stress on that arm that doesn't need to be there. Once we've done that first drill, we can progress to other drills. This is one of our favorites, uh, resist, resisted rows. Again, just again, abduction, abduction, and, and induction, and making sure that our, our arms are getting loose before we've even thrown a ball. Uh, we don't grab a ball, you know, probably for about 15 minutes altogether uh, by the time we've touched a football. Because from here, uh, we're gonna progress from bands to tennis ball work. And some people say, well, why do we work tennis balls? First is to, so that we're actually getting a sweat on uh, during our warm up. We don't want to progress directly to a football. And again, the weight of a football and, and the stress that's going to come on our shoulders from that football. Uh, we want to progress to a tennis ball where it's nice and easy. And you're going to see us just lobbing the tennis ball here. Uh, this was a drill. Again, you can see two of our quarterbacks spaced about 15 yards apart, just lobbing the ball. And all they're trying to do is get their feet activated, just like they would circle the ball when we're getting a gun snap and we're throwing quick game. They're going to do the exact same thing with a tennis ball right now, moving around just like they would uh, potentially through the pocket. But again, uh, getting the ball out quickly, uh, getting themselves into a good throwing position and constantly just delivering. Again, getting a bit of a sweat on, but it, only just you know getting that arm motion going. Again, not getting overly loose until we get to the point where uh, we're ready to pick a football up and then begin the process of a regular warm-up that you would see uh, from most teams um, you know, in any conference. So we're really, really careful now. Um, you know, we've had you know, quarterbacks with shoulder problems um, and you know, we, just, we wanna make sure that we minimize that. So it's become a really, really important thing for us. Um, the next section that we wanna talk about is drills that fit what we want to do. Um, you know, for us, we're a quick passing team, as we said. So, um, you know, for us, it's all about getting the ball out quick. The first thing, the first drill you're going to see is just us catch rock, step, throw. It's just as true one step. And we want to throw on time. So throws that we would make like this. And again, we'll, 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 we'll do a little pausing here. So this was early in the process working with Noah. Uh, and you can see uh, he's opening up. It's just one step. And he puts his foot down and throw. What we're wanting to do here is we want this left foot to come down even quicker than it is right now. Um, the, the process of getting the ball out is something that's so important. Um, and it's, the, it's a time where we can make up actually two tenths of a second uh, when we watch film uh, relative to you know, most quarterbacks when we take them over. It's really a, a huge opportunity because when you think on the back end of two tenths of a second, um, if I said a, a player was running a four six versus a four eight, we all recognize that that's a massive difference. But we can help our, our athletes become faster and more efficient on the back end once they get the ball out. Uh, by getting the ball out of our quarterback's hands even quicker. So one of the things we've worked specifically with, with our guys on is getting that foot down in the ground even quickly, quicker than they are. Like right now, in some ways, it looks a little robotic as it's coming out. And it looks almost manufactured. We almost want it to look like ballet steps where it's coming out very quick. We're, we're very quick on our feet and we're really, really active and, and fast. So we're getting a lot better at that and we've progressed, no doubt about it. Uh, throws that we would make with this step specifically uh, without any reset that you'll see in a moment would just be true hitches or any kind of quick screen game. So whether we're throwing alley screen, tunnel screen, bubble screen, any of that stuff would come out like this, but also our true hitch games where we're throwing it at 10. The next drill that you're going to see is going to be uh, the progression to that. And so what I've told you guys uh, a little earlier in the call or in the call was that we've gotten away from gun and three, and we really have, and we're going to more of this, which is catch rock, step, throw, reset, throw. And why that, and why that is, is that this gives us the opportunity um, to um, throw on time, be prepared to throw at any given moment. And it's, sorry, just a little technical difficulty here. Apologize for this. We'll just start from here again and it'll go. 
So it's giving us the opportunity to um, be ready to throw at all times. So that you're going to see here, Noah's going to go catch rock step, reset throw. So for us on this type of throw, what you're going to see is uh, if we're throwing smash, for instance, this would be a great opportunity for us to throw smash. So if we have a hitch on the outside at, let's say, six yards, and then the corner from the inside, and you'll see it actually work out. I think we actually have it uh, clipped up after this. Um, we we want to throw the hitch. We're, we're reading the corner, and we'll talk about how our reads work. Um, and this is where we would throw the hitch right here. So it's catch rock, step, throw. We're looking to throw uh, the hitch on the outside of the field off the corner. If the corner drives down, and now we've got a man situation, or we get a cut situation, which has a couple different rules, but... Uh, but the man situation, we're going to reset our feet just like this, and now we're prepared, we're pre uh, prepared to throw the corner deep one-on-one um, -on -one with whether it be the Will or the Sam linebacker. So for us, it's really, really important that we're ready to throw at two different occasions through this. Um, doing a true gun in three put us into a disadvantaged situation where we felt like the wideout was waiting for the ball a little bit longer than we wanted him to be doing. Uh, and we just keep seeing more and more teams now, specifically in the United States, where uh, where they focus on quick games so much, uh, going to catch rock, step, throw, reset, throw. And, and we just saw so much value in it uh, that we couldn't help ourselves but to uh, to follow suit this way. So catch rock, step, uh, throw, reset, throw gives us the opportunity to be ready to throw two different types of throws on the same drop. Uh, and so we, we love that. So what's cool here is we've got two different versions of the same play. So now you're going to actually get to see the whole thing come together. So you can see Noah here is in the gun, and we've got the number three receiver here, although there's only two guys out there right now. We don't need, when we put together a row concept for practice and for, for workout purposes, all we need to do is create the two players that are creating the bind. So in this case, we've got our number one and our number three. There's a number two who would be invisible, but we just don't need, well, we don't have the numbers and some of the workouts that we've had in the past and, and the opportunities that we've had. But also uh, for us to be able to go one and three and have a corner is really what we're trying to do. And we'll show how that looks. But uh, three is going to run the skinny corner and he's going to outside release the number three receiver. And you can use any of Coach Galloway's release techniques. They were fantastic, Coach. Really appreciated listening. Um, and then restack, uh, keep it skinny and let, let Noah throw him downfield if he needs or to the sidelines if he needs to. Um, and again, our number one receiver is going to be running uh, a hitch at six yards. Noah's steps right now is he's going to be driving and working to drive off that first step right now. So he's putting himself in a position to throw the hitch. As you can see right now, um, if, if the corner sinks, he's going to take it. If the corner drives down on it, he's going to reset his feet. Um, uh oh, not this again. Uh, reset his feet and, uh, and, throw the, and throw the corner. So as you can see here, as he drives out, he drives down. So no, now and now Noah resets his feet. Uh, could be a little bit better right here. You can see he only resets them just for a split second. We'd like to see him ga gather and, and uh, push for just a little bit more depth than he has. We'd like to see him at about six and a half yards as opposed to six where he's at. But again, the reset was enough in this case to, to create enough time. And this is the overhead view of the same play. So again, you can see right now he's done a good job of driving. He's now resetting his feet based on what the corner is driving down. And you can see right now we've restacked from the, the, the number three receiver over either the Sam who's rotated over or the Will who's kicked out. Uh, and now the ball's coming out on time on the break. The other key thing to note is uh, our, our number three receiver is going to break at the depth of the deep third defender. And we're not going to throw until the receiver stepped his foot into the ground. So our ability to catch rock step, re uh, catch rock step throw, reset throw uh, also comes with a patter on the end. So that if we're not ready to throw at that particular time, uh, the quarterback will just patter his feet for a split second, similar to what you would see Drew Brees do. So if you're looking for an example or some inspiration on that, if you look to Drew Brees, who has just who had tremendous feet in the pocket, uh, or Peyton Manning, uh, certainly back in the day, uh, is what we're looking for, that quick, quick action movement uh, until you're ready to put yourself into a position to throw. So that would be a smash with a catch rock, step throw, reset throw. So what we're looking to do there is, again, have drills that fit what we're trying to do. So our, our, our initial drill was, you know, throwing one step, throwing three step. You know, we're not looking to make all these off time throws. We're just trying to make sure that we're able to make throws on time all the time. So the next, the next key point is the attention to detail and coach what you see. And this is something that's so important. And I think, you know, as quarterback coaches, as coordinators, uh, it happens so, uh, things happen so quickly on the field and recognizing that we have such fantastic resources now with film, um, to be able to teach and coach our players, you know, we don't always have to have the answers on the field. And sometimes it's okay 
um, to say, I'm not sure based on what I, you know, what, what just happened. You know, we stay engaged with our quarterbacks all the time. We have, um, you know, we've set up chat groups for us uh, throughout the course of the day. They upload, especially in, in times of COVID, they upload their own videos uh, that you'll see. Some of these videos were done individually by our quarterbacks, you know, at their homes or at their home areas uh, where they're able to upload video to us. And we're all able to make comments on it and look at, you know, the technique that's being done. So we're really trying to engage the room. We're trying to create a culture where everybody, you know, it's an inclusive environment where we're all, um, you know, we all have a voice and, you know, really uh, don't look at it like my voice is any more powerful voice than theirs. Once we've taught concepts, there's no magic formula. I, I don't have any magic uh, answers that, that we wouldn't have. We, we teach a concept, we all learn it and understand it, and we're all able to help and, and aid each other inside that room. So we've created a, an environment of engagement. Um, we're not afraid to watch film and coach, you know, coach later. There's, there's so many times you know, when we've watched, you know, you know, with, with our young guys, when we were, when we were out there in the fall, but, you know, it's more, I guess, more in games and practices with my guys at Toronto or, or St. Mary's where when we're in practice and sometimes our eyes just don't have the opportunity to see, you know, a will linebacker or a half or a corner, and we have to rely on what the quarterback's telling us. And we end up having these long conversations on the field that just aren't a good use of our time. So it's okay to say, you know what, we'll get it on film. We'll be able to talk about it later. Uh, and we're going to have attention to detail when we watch it on film. And we're going to talk to specifics at that point, whether it's, you know, was our foot down quick enough? Were our eyes on the corner? Were our eyes on the corner long enough? Do we, you know, do we get off things too quickly? Things that we sometimes just can't see on the film. So it's not, uh, it's not, it's, it's something that we want to really make sure that we're doing. And then ask ourselves, you know, every time before we give feedback, like why did something happen? You know, before we just start talking, we don't want to, you know, go down a long winded answer when we're not even sure if we're right, because that's how we lose confidence in players, right? And we really wanna make sure, especially at the quarterback position in this country, you know, it's it's no surprise, like it's, it's, it's no shock that, you know, for a long time, there haven't been Canadian quarterbacks in the CFL. And, you know, we need to do a better job of developing quarterbacks at, at this level, uh, at the high school level, at the university level, at the pro level, um, you know, and give those opportunities. And in order to do that, we need to make sure that we're teaching the right skills, we're focusing on them all the time, and, you know, again, we understand and we have an understanding and appreciation for why things are happening. So one of the things that I found really, you know, helpful for myself is just constantly asking myself, why did that happen? And if I don't have the answers, again, waiting until a later time to be able to coach and teach it and understanding that that's okay. And that they'll, you know, uh, they'll learn better from that. And there'll be a greater appreciation and respect in the room because of it. And then the final is managing workload. And I think this is something that may be, uh, you know, pretty surprising. Um, for people, you know, we look at, you know, what time of the year is it? And, you know, based on that time of the year, how many throws do we want to make? So we track our quarterbacks competitive throws. Now, that doesn't mean the warm up throws. We don't count those as we're warming up like that. Those throws don't count. It's only once we start engaging our core and, and throwing, you know, anything more than 10 to 12 yards that would be thrown, you know, a high velocity, like we would throw a hitch in a game. That's when we want to start tracking. So since COVID, has started. We haven't had our quarterbacks may make more than 45 competitive throws in any one day at any time. If we get to that stage, we've cut them off. Our goal is to make a maximum of 65 competitive throws, but we only do that once a week. Um, and that includes indie, indie session, right? Like there's like the, some of the drills that you're seeing, that's what we focus on our indie time on with our quarterbacks. So you'll see us doing a lot of two-on-one uh, breakdown because really reading is an individual skill that we just don't work enough on. We work footwork, footwork, footwork. To us, when we look at what footwork is, we see that as a a, a skill that needs to be developed in the off season, developed in pre practice, and developed in post practice opportunities. That two hours or two and a half hours, depending on where you're practicing, um, is is a window of time that you know when we have all those players together, it's just so important that we utilize and. Uh, use those resources in a way that is effective for everybody. So we want to make sure that we're making competitive throws. We're reading, we're getting the chance to utilize, you know, uh, if we're in a special teams period, you know, using the players that aren't on specials to be able to read and practice read concepts and including those throws, we make sure we stay under, you know, between 45 and 65, even on a game week. So that gives all of our quarterbacks an opportunity to get reps and opportunity to show what they can do and how they read and improve. Uh, and, and again, I mean, that, that's going to allow them to become their best selves as they develop through their careers as well. Uh, but yeah, inside, uh, inside of uh, uh, um, the yeah, off season, we're between 25 and 45 throws when they have a throwing session. So some of these throwing sessions can be pretty quick, but it's really important that they're, they're focused on quality. Uh, again, really focusing on reading every chance they get. That's the thing that's going to make them better and better as we go. 
So when we talk about the ability to read as, as, as opposed to the physical, um, there's some things that can help us get the ball out so, so quicker. So we saw that putting your foot in the ground quicker helps us get the ball out and can shave two tenths of a second off. But there's some things mentally that can, we can do that, that allow the ball to come out quicker as well. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to create rules that are consistent. So for instance, when we read, we try to create a two on one bind. And you know, if, if you watch or get a chance to watch some of the other presentations that I've done over the course of years, you'll hear me talk a lot about numbers and leverage and attacking with a competitive numerical advantage at all times. So I think you know, there's some opportunities to watch some of those talks and now recognizing that when I tell you that we should be throwing into three on three situations, two on two, one on one, or four on four situations when at all possible. Um, so what we wanna do in those situations, we wanna focus on a key defender. I think the easiest way to explain this to everybody and the reason why I showed that play is smash. I think almost everybody recognizes that smash is a corner read. What I'm not sure everybody recognizes uh, through my experience is that every play has a key read just like that. And I've heard so many people explain alley reads or you know, progressional reads or top down or bottom up. And to me, I think from a quarterback's perspective, it's too much. Um, there's too much going on. And we say, well, don't we want them to handle more? Actually, no, we want simplicity. Quarterbacks crave it. They, cr they crave rules, responsibility, and simplicity in, 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 in their execution. Um, I could tell you that some of the things just because they run it, you know, on an NFL screen or a CFL screen doesn't make it right. Uh, it just means that they're doing it. Uh, but some of the most effective plays that they run, of course, are smash. There's a reason why everybody runs smash because it's a simple play to run. It's effective. And that's how they, that's how they read it. So we've tried to make every single one of our plays and concepts readable that way. So creating that two on one bind uh, and ensuring that no third party can influence it. And if they do influence it, that, wherever they leave, there is a place to go to from there. So for instance, the easiest way to show that is if we ran three hitches across the board and we were to have a bind on the that side half, so if we're running three receivers into the boundary and we had three defenders over there, we would be reading off the half. If the will slid to get underneath the number two, if they played cut, it would get cloudy from the inside because the half sinking would tell us to throw to number two, but then cloudy from the inside, from the will expanding, we would go inside and throw to the number three receiver. So our rules always take us that way. And, and again, that two on one bind has been created, but the rest of the route construct allows us to uh, have a place to go with our eyes. So cloudy from the inside, uh, we go inside. Here's a few concepts just of smash again, just for you guys to see. And you can see in this case, uh, again, up here at the top of the screen against Carlton, uh, we're reading off the, the boundary corner. You can see he drives down here uh, on, on the wide out. And obviously, uh, even though they have a bust in coverage as well, it looks like somebody falls down, but it would have been a one-on-one -on -one situation to the corner anyways. So it would have been a good situation for us. Uh, you can see Nolan uh, gets off the release and, and obviously defender falls. Um, The next concept again uh, against Queens, it's just smash again. Again, we're reading this time to the field side. As you can see, we have a true three on three over there. You can see the corner finally drives at the last second down, giving us the opportunity to go over the top. Uh, unfortunately, the ball wasn't caught on this particular case, but it's a great uh, it's a great opportunity to see smash and the way that that play develops. And again, the two on one bind. If I just roll it back uh, right to here, uh, even though just like I showed you that drill a few moments ago, uh, really. If you're if you're if you're repping this drill and you want to get you know lots of quarterbacks if you have four quarterbacks on your roster you know all you really need for this drill is a number one receiver a number three receiver and and the corner um, and you can really teach your quarterbacks how to have great active eyes and be able to see and as he drives down or tries to hang the play uh, you're ready to throw the ball uh, again you can see you know we've we need to speed this up you know play should be ready to throw and drive right now. Uh, we were we were still a little bit more of a gun and three team in 2019, whereas we'll be a gun catch rock step reset throw. Uh, and again, as we talked about running the depth of the depth, uh, uh, the depth of the corner at the depth of the deep third defender, as opposed to, let's say, 12 yards arbitrarily, uh, we're trying to make sure that uh, we force this this defender. Like if we had just run this at 12, I think he's already at he's at 12 right now at 11. So he'd be breaking to the corner. And this guy, because he hasn't won yet and he hasn't actually had the chance to win. Uh, he'd be driving him to the sidelines, which would make this highly effective for this corner to be able to hang this play. Even though he's playing man, he'd be able to sit through, read through, and fall off and maybe even get an interception here. So us extending this route first to get to the depth of the de deep third defender, and then secondly to win this route, uh, and then Clay obviously now knowing that he can't throw. So he knows now at this stage that based on his leverage, and his, that's all he's doing is staring at this defender. 
Um, he knows now that he's throwing the corner. So now he just has to wait for the, the receiver to stick his foot in the ground, which happens right now and the ball's gone. Um, so yeah, obviously uh, a disappointing result of the play, but um, you know, uh, you know, the, the uh, process was good for us, uh, both by receiver and by quarterback. And then again, you can just see again, what that looks like. So this would be our number three receiver here, just like you saw on film a second ago. And our number one, there's our corner. The only reason this defender is here, he's actually not defending. He's just there to ensure that we get an outside release. The last thing we want to do is go inside and, and create a, a leverage of uh, opportunity. You know, again, all those great things that Coach Galloway was saying about releases earlier are all applicable here. So we want to outside restack in this particular case, get vertical. As you can see, there's the lean afterwards that uh, Coach was talking about and that, that we use as well. Um, there's our, our receiver, obviously, uh, you know, breaking at six and the ball's coming out. It is a little late right now. It could be just a split second earlier. You can see uh, we actually get a false step here from the quarterback. And obviously these are things that we coach all the time, right? And these are drills that we have to work. Like if we, and I could tell you that we're not a team that has 80,000 plays in our playbook or 48 even plays in our playbook. You know, we have basically six to seven key passing concepts um, and we still bust. So I can't imagine how difficult it is to coach 48 concepts when we still bust with six. And that's everywhere I've been and everywhere I've seen. So we just wanna get really, really good at those concepts, uh, run those concepts when we have an advantage, um, and then obviously execute those. Uh, tie the, the drops together with, and you can see much better drop here. You can see he's ready to throw on his first step. You can see the, the defender is now driving down. So you should be a reset here from the quarterback, which you get. He's now reset and we're throwing the deep corner. So the next one is focus on improved timing. Um, so the first thing is timing can be improved by speeding up your feet, uh, making less natural movements more natural. Um, and we've got some clips to show things that we do to speed our feet up all the time. And our quarterbacks probably hate these periods. Uh, they fit into our individual time period, uh, but they are all about hard work, all about you know quick, quick movements and, and trying to get better. Uh, and then the second part, timing can be improved through you know, visual recognition. Uh, so we provide opportunities for visual recognition outside of just practice. Uh, right now, we're working with both two-dimensional and three-dimensional objects. You'll see some of our two-dimensional object, uh, object work uh, here throughout uh, the next five clips. I think they're pretty cool. Uh, we offer this for, for our camps, but you know, we, the, you know, basically what we've offered for this camp coming up is really cool is that it's just our experience of being in our quarterback room. So this is what it looks like to be in our quarterback room. And this is some of the things that we've been able to do through COVID uh, that you're going to see right here. The first one is just, uh, you know, some hard. 23, 23. Oh. We're going lion. Sam is phantom. Uh, tail, your free release. Field, we're going Gretzky. Uh, boundary, we got craps. Wednesday, Wednesday, go Sahat. We're taking the back. So you can see for us right there, all we're doing is using two dimensional objects, uh, similar to what you get with film, no doubt. The advantage for us off, off of doing that is we control all the elements. So we can give any given look that we want and we can put it together and we can have 60 to 80 looks for them ready for a meeting. And we just, we just rep through a, uh, you know, a, a script just like we would at practice, um, just like that. So it gives us an opportunity with two dimensional objects to be able to read in real time. That was them reading full field on obviously what looked like over under. Um, and they'll, you know, they just walk through their whole play call, then the ball comes up and they, they have a key defender, they watch that key defender and, and they read it out. In order to get there, um, uh, we had to figure out obviously how to break it down for them. So this is all hitches for us. Uh, and this is how it would look for all hitches and they would make their decision based on this, again, two dimensional objects. But how we actually teach this from the very beginning is just breaking it down to its absolute lowest common denominator, which was again, if I just break it back down here, you can see just the quarterback, the center, the two receivers and the one defender that we're putting in the bind. So you can see in this case, we're, we're, we're putting the half in the bind between the number two receiver this time and the number one receiver. And as the number two defender, the half jumps down or aggressively shoots down on the, on the number two defender, whether it be hold or man, we kick it out to the number one receiver who does have conversion rules if he's getting press coverage. But uh, for the purposes of this drill, he's not getting press coverage and we're just throwing hitches. So we're able to show our quarterbacks a whole bunch of series of this where they could train their eyes and know, okay, I've got to look at this defender over and over and over again. And when they get really good at this, now break it out to 
uh, the full field where they're able to look at two dimensional objects and make these real time decisions and then transition it to film. And we also have some three dimensional opportunities for them as well, which is really, really cool. Um, and things that we've been developing over the course of, of the last year to get us ready for our next season. So we're really excited about it. And again, this is just hitches broken down. So, so this is us going out on the field now, taking that last drill that you just saw um, on the two-dimensional objects and just turning it into real life. So uh, here's the same, just like you saw on the, on the PowerPoint slide, uh, where the dot, uh, the half dot attacked the number two receiver dot. Well, here it's actually a half, just uh, you know, either playing hold or man, and us kicking it out to the number one receiver. So bringing that concept to real life uh, and giving them an idea of how to, uh, you know, take everything that they've done and uh, um, and create reality with it. So it's really great for us. So the other thing, the other way I told you we could speed up decision making again is just by having faster feet. In order to do that, we have lots of drills that we love to do during our indie time. Line hop is certainly one of those drills uh, that we think gives us a, a huge advantage. Uh, and, and, and again, just creates a, a great work ethic for our guys. Uh, you know, we'll use a 30 second uh, tempo uh, period where we're just gonna go and, and get our heart rates up uh, before we do a reading exercise. So we may do four of those in a row, whether it be that line hop uh, or uh, going to a crisscross as you're about to see right now, I believe the line scissors here. So anything that gets our heart rate up before we're gonna you know, make decisions and create those two-on-one binds inside of an indie period. So always you know, uh, making sure that our drills, again, match exactly what it is we're trying to do, uh, match exactly what it is uh, our, our concepts are about, and, and again, speed up our feet. The final one, again, is just a bit of a bunny hop here. Uh, so the ball's all, always high, always ready to throw. Again, just about getting our heart rate up, about improving our speed, uh, uh, about being quick, um, and again, uh, creating an opportunity for us to uh, uh, think under pressure uh, when we go to the next drill, which will be something uh, of a two-on-one bind situation in our indie periods. The final one uh, is actually probably my favorite drill, and any quarterback that's ever played for me knows that whether we're doing this with a tennis ball or we're doing this with footballs, a double play drill or an RPO drill or circle the football drill uh, is, is, I mean, something that we do every single day. Um, and again, it's really important that our guys circle the football or circus, circle the tennis ball and really put yourselves into a throwing position on every play. You can already see how this would be an RPO and how the, the footwork would develop inside of RPO. Um, so this is something that's really, really important for us there, but also in quick game as well. You can see Noah's doing a really outstanding job right now of making sure that his feet are ready to throw on every single, on every single rep. Uh, and again, we'll do this, uh, you know, usually for four minutes uh, during our, our pre-practice uh, or uh, in any workout that we have against the wall for about a four minute period as well. Really trying to make sure that, you know, again, um, all of our steps are quick. They're not robotic and they're not manufactured. So again, film is a chance to make decisions. When we watch film, um, you know, whether, again, whether it's, um, you know, true wide or tight or some of the overhead stuff that you've seen, which I absolutely love from a quarterback's perspective, it's fantastic. Um, it, it's an opportunity uh, in, in film sessions for, for quarterbacks to take reps. And I think so often when we watch film as, quarter, as coaches, we wanna talk through the coaching points. This is a tremendous opportunity for our quarterbacks to talk through coaching points and empowering them to show that they have knowledge and show that their you know, decision-making abilities can happen in real time, or uh, even more importantly, at the time of which the, the play is happening. So, you know, if you're watching, um, you know, smash, uh, you know, out of whatever formation that you're running, you know, have one of your quarterbacks talk through the play before you coach the points and have them talk about where they would throw the ball on the, on the decision-making point. And it gives you an opportunity for them to get a rep who, you know, especially a quarterback who's not getting a lot of your reps, it gives them an opportunity to get a rep in a, in a you know, uh, an environment that there's coaching and feedback being given to them with a little bit of pressure as well. So you may not be able to give up those reps, you know, to your fourth or fifth or sixth string quarterbacks on the field, but there's no reason why, you know, in a, in a controlled environment like this, that they, get, they, they can't have opportunities to get better and improve as well. 
Uh, because in most times, you know, some of our young quarterbacks are just getting scout team reps and they're not getting the opportunity to really understand and prove that they know that the offense that, that you're running. And again, engage them, ask questions in your quarterback meetings. Um, you know, I, we talk about all the time, you know, Coach Craney, when he hired me, you know, we talked about empowering our quarterbacks uh, right from the very first conversation we've had. And it's something that was really important to him. And it's something that I've, 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 I thought that it's been important uh, since I played. And I think it's, you know, it's something that the more, I don't want to say, I say the more responsibility our quarterbacks feel and have, uh, the more in tune of the process they are and the more, the better results generally we're going to have. So, uh, you know, ask them questions, empower them to, um, you know, be leaders in the room uh, and, and don't just place, you know, all the leadership on your starting quarterback, because, you know, if you have an injury, uh, and you end up going to a number two and he's not getting the reps or he's not getting the opportunity or he's not being empowered in meetings or practice, um, you know, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to wish that you had uh, when that situation comes. So it's really, really an important opportunity and, and time. And again, just again, showing what film looks like for us, just another opportunity to show field side smash this time. So you can see we actually snap it in on field side smash when we run it out of a two receiver set if we're in 23. But again, all we're doing is you can see the, the steps for the quarterback again, just trying to show you one last time. It's catch rock step throw and then the reset throw, and, but not needed this time. It was just catch rock step throw as, as the corner bailed. So again, everything for us is in line with catch rock step throw, reset throw. Um, making sure that the ball is coming out on time is, is super important for us. Uh, just one last time before I before I wrap it up and hope hope there's some questions for me. Uh, but before I wrap it up, just wanted to uh, recap one last time that starting on June the 27th, we are running our camps. And, and many of the things that you saw today, we focus on including reading and advanced reading techniques, uh, introductory reading techniques. It doesn't have to be an elite quarterback that's coming to it. We're happy to teach new quarterbacks, especially with times of COVID. This might be their first chance or time or opportunity that they've had to read and we can break it right down as you saw right to the initial two on one bind. So we're super excited. So if you've got some young quarterbacks that are looking for an opportunity to develop, uh, and we do have some opportunities for high school coaches to come and, and pay attention to what we're doing and, and learn what we're teaching so that uh, you can have dialogue and empower your quarterbacks uh, through the dialogue that they're able to have with us and also understand it yourself. So super excited about uh, how that's happening and, and just wanted to share that with everybody. And uh, turn it back over. Again, one last chance for everybody if you want my email address or uh, my, my uh, uh, social media account. Uh, by all means, happy to hear from anybody and uh, really excited to engage um, on any topic uh, that we spoke about today. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. So we do have a couple questions. Uh, so the first question that we have is, um, in terms, you know, uh, we just talked with Coach Galloway about the receivers um, and, and their role. How important is the role that the quarterback and, and receiver relationship plays in the decision-making process for the quarterback and trusting that the receivers are going to, you know, like you said, you're giving receivers maybe some flexibility to make a break based off of, you know, the, the, the distance that the, the corner is based off instead of a, okay, run it at 12 yards. How important is the quarterback and the receiver relationship in the process and, and them being successful? Yeah, it's really important. Uh, Aaron, it's a great question. Um, it's one of the reasons why we don't run a lot of concepts. Uh, we want our guys to understand the ins and the outs of the concept, you know, to, to, to no end. And, and to Coach Galloway's point, there's there's multiple ways and, you know, uh, leverages that you can create, um, you know, to run your releases, you know, based on whether you're getting pressed and soft and all those things. So we want to give, you know, that understanding to our players so that they know, you know, again, uh, an outside release is an outside release and an inside release is an inside release. We don't have best releases. We have hard and fast rules. Um, but we really want to make sure that our players understand those rules and that they can appreciate exactly where, you know, you know, where they're supposed to be and where they're going. To your point on smash, yeah, we do have some flexibility on depth of the route because the reality is if that corner continues to carry vertically as long as we're carrying vertical, we'll actually never snap to the corner. So we can actually run smash with a hitch from number one and our number three receiver just runs a go because that corner continues to carry vertical to 30 yards. So we'll never actually break because when we break to the corner, it gives that corner an opportunity to look to see if the ball's up. And when he sees that the ball's up and it's kicked out to the hitch, he's going to rally down to make a tackle. Um, you know, we've got some, you know, film from Toronto in 2019 where we've thrown hitches to the number one receiver. And because the number three receiver never broke to the corner, uh, because the corner continued to barrel, uh, uh, bail, 
uh, we've caught the ball before the corners even realizing that he has to roll, rail, uh, rally down and make a tackle. So uh, it's it's huge. It's really important the communication that happens between the quarterbacks and receivers, and that they're on the same page. And it's one of the reasons why we don't run a lot of plays, so that they can always be on the same page. There's no misunderstandings. There's no miscommunications, uh, and, it, and it flows seamlessly. So there's been a lot of change in the way quarterback play uh, occurs and, and the talent and skill set of quarterbacks over the past 10 years. And, you know, I, I generally have always thought that our Canadian game, you know, has, has led well for mobile quarterbacks because of the space. And, but, you know, we look down to the U S right now and, and basically the trend is these dual threat mobile and, and, and throwing quarterback for you how important is it or is it important to have somebody who can have some mobility and and make plays when plays break down or is that just an added benefit um it's both um i mean you know i, I want I, i'd love you know our quarterbacks to have every tool at their disposal right um but the better passer they are the less important their their athleticism is i mean if i've got you know the best passer in the country i'm not gonna you know i'm not gonna you know be too upset that, you know, that he's, you know, a little less mobile than we'd like. Um, but yeah, I mean, having additional tools like athleticism and mobility is, is huge. And I mean, obviously inside the run game and what you can do, and, you know, we've had the, the opportunity to real, you know, utilize some of our quarterbacks athleticism with the Q draw game or option game. And we enjoy doing that. Um, but yeah, like I said, if we had a guy who, you know, was, was really a great reader and passer and, uh, you know, protected the football well, we'd be happy to, to use that as well. I think, you know, one of the reasons things have happened that way is, you know, the game has gone to a lot of passing. There are some really, really fast and dynamic players. And then what ends up happening is, you know, they'll throw into, you know, third and eight or third and nine, and you get into, you know, teams playing match coverage or too high coverage, and there's nowhere to go with the ball. And these quarterbacks have no choice but to do, you know, to buy time for themselves. We try and avoid that at all costs uh, so that where our quarterbacks aren't running that way. We want, when we want it, when we want to run, um, you know, we want those plays to be, designed runs or designed option plays or designed shovel plays or RPOs uh, that create movement that we're uh, dictating. We don't want, you know, to be dictated to because we don't have somewhere to go with the ball. Uh, but yeah, athleticism is always, and I think it's always the way it's the way this game's going right now. Um, athleticism is, is an important component to playing quarterback. So we've, we talked on the Thursday night, we had our non-contact night and we were talking about flag and touch and, and, and really the growth of, you know, regular tackle players or, or players who've never played tackle and like growing up playing flag or non-contact and the development that has on, on the passing game and, and the, in the quarterbacks. And I guess I, I just want to know what your take is in terms of the off season for quarterbacks, right. And, and, and what they're doing, because we talked a lot about strength and conditioning, but for quarterbacks, I, I think that's obviously important, but you know, getting throwing reps and obviously not, not wrecking your shoulder though at the same time. And, and, and what, what do you suggest for young quarterbacks as they're developing um, to really hit their prime when they get uh, into university? Yeah, that's a great question too. Um, you know, and had a lot of really, really great conversations with our strength and conditioning coach, uh, coach Sam Miles Frain about it. You know, lifting for quarterbacks is still such an area that people are uncomfortable with, or, you know, aren't, you know, we, we you know, we recognize that quarterbacks are different and their strengths are different than a linebacker or a running back, or certainly an old lineman and even a receiver. And I think that, um, you know, we need to tailor the workouts to that. Obviously we want them strength and conditioning. Uh, we want to make sure they're long and lean and that they're athletic. Um, when it comes to throwing in the off season, you know, I think, you know, touching on it a little bit about, you know, minimizing the amounts of throws, maximizing the things that they can do with their feet in the off season to put themselves in a real, you know, really good position to throw, um, you know, working, you know, when we get that 25 minute period in Indy or 15 minute of Indy, depending on the practice day, it's so difficult to provide that time for fundamental skill development, like, you know, quick feed or pocket management. Like those are things that have to be done in the off season. And, you know, first of all, it gives us the opportunity to, you know, get an anaerobic workout and all those things that we need to do in the off season. But it also gives us a path and a journey for us to get better and actually use those skills uh, and, and, and focus that time on those skills in the off season that we're not going to get to use in the in season as much. We do want to throw year round. Uh, it's super important that we do. But it's also, you know, important to understand that, you know, we're talking about, you know, as young as 12 and as, as old as, you know, 24 right now when we're talking about university players, 
um, young arms that are developing. And, and, you know, we look at baseball pitchers now and we see, you know, how much Tommy John surgery and how much, you know, how much surgery is happening and how much, you know, the taxing that's happening to, to arms. And we watch, you know, I mean, log on to any Instagram account of any quarterback coach across North America right now, and you're going to watch off timing throws that are torquing, you know, shoulders and elbows like crazy um, because it sells, right? Like when I watch it, it's impressive. Like, I, 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 you know, I'm as guilty as anybody when I watch it being like, wow, that kid, can, that kid can sling it. And, you know, that's a kid we want. Um, and I want to get to know him better. Like he, like he can do all the things that we would want him to do. But the question is, how well does he do the things that we need him to do? Um, you know, and, and so, you know, to me, you know, when you're 14, 15, 16, just working on, you know, you know, throwing on time, making, you know, reads that are, you know, easy and understandable and getting really great at it and being an accurate passer and getting your feet together and, you know, being uh, organized in your thought when you're at the line of scrimmage, those are things that are, you know, really going to make the difference for you. Um, and again, I understand the, the dynamic and why it sells. And, and again, I'm as guilty as anybody when I watch it, but, you know, those are the things that we should be working on in the off season, I think specifically. So uh, last question, and, and you kind of touched on it a little bit in, in your last answer, but when, when you're looking at young quarterbacks and looking to recruit quarterbacks and, and, and trying to figure out what would be a good fit either for your system or at the next level, you know, what, are, what are maybe one or two of the, the intangibles that you're looking for in a kid to play quarterback at the U sports level? Yeah. I mean, for me, the first thing I look at is, is does he, how bad does he want it? Um, you know, if, if you come into, I, I will say this for our quarterback room, um, they, they are constantly working. They're, they're the hardest. This is the hardest working group of kids that I've been around, uh, you know, through my last, you know, four or five years now in U sport, uh, really, really happy with where we're at as a quarterback room. Uh, you know, it's really important that we, anybody we add in uh, continues to have that attitude of, um, you know, work is something that I want to do. You know, I want to be great. Uh, I want us to be great as a team and I'm going to do everything I can to support my teammates to be great. Um, so that's the first thing is that, 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 that willingness to uh, want to improve, want to get better and want to work. Um, yeah. And then a really, really open mind and attitude. Uh, and, and, you know, somebody that, you know, and again, this is from that side and we'll get to the physical side too, because I think they're two separate, uh, they're two separate things. You know, some, somebody who, um, you know, is, is a good responsible teammate, uh, cares about people. Um, you know, it, it's really, really important at this position. And, you know, specifically we, we hand over a lot of responsibility. We write, for those that don't know, we run a no huddle offense. Uh, we're at the line of scrimmage. We turn a lot of play calling over to our quarterbacks. So they call more plays than I do. Uh, and it's been that way since 2017. Um, so, you know, for us to do that, it's about education, empowerment, but they have to have a great head on their shoulders an understanding of what we're trying to do an understanding of, uh, of, of caring about their teammates and not about it being about them or about being about one of their specific teammates, but about doing the right for the thing for the team, if that means handing the ball off in certain situations. And, um, you know, it's really important for us to find character kids like that. Then from a physical perspective, yeah, we're looking for arm strength and athleticism. You know, it's really, really important that we get, you know, first arm strength and, and the ability to read and think on the field and then athleticism. But we, we love it when, when they have both for sure. Uh, that's fantastic coach. Thank you so much. Um, so in, in, in wrapping up, I just want to say uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk quarterbacks, you know, our Canadian game quarterbacks are so essential in the development process and we need as many quarterbacks as we can developing so that we can maintain you know, the aerial attacks that we'd love to see. I love seeing open, you know, three, three or four, two concepts. It's, it's so exciting and fun to see that stuff. So I'm looking forward to see what you guys do next season. Uh, as soon as we get back on the field and uh, appreciate you coming today. Thanks, Aaron. It's a lot of fun. Appreciate it. No problem.